the recording is already started. Are there any questions? No. Okay. Yep. So we're going to talk about binary comparison today, which is based on binary subtraction. So some of the discussion today can be seen as a review of the you know, um, concepts that you also need to understand for the exam. So today is somewhat like a review, even though we are also expanding and introducing new concepts as well. So looking at the time, it is uh, 10.30 already. I am going to get started, even though more than half of the class is not here. Okay, but since everything is being recorded, it's being recorded. All right, so the first thing we want to do is to talk about binary comparison again. And at this time, we'll look at a 4-bit subtraction. So we'll work out a few examples first, okay, and then we'll talk about the concepts. So we'll work out some 4-bit binary subtractions, okay? Because comparison is based on subtraction. In other words, the circuitry that we have already you know, talked about, which is the adder, can easily be converted into a subtractor by negating x first, okay? And also converting how you know, the, um, the b you know, function works. So it's pretty easy to do the conversion. And then once we have a subtractor, uh, we have the basic mechanism to do comparison. However, the result of a comparison is not always easy to interpret. And that's what we're going to do today, is to look at the result of after a binary subtraction, and then to figure out whether the minuend, which is x, is less than the subtrahend, which is what we usually know as y in the, in the subtraction. So we'll deal with 4-bit subtractions, and the reason why I'm going to emphasize you know, on 4-bit is because you know, we don't want to you know, get too many bits, you know, because otherwise you know, things just get a little bit out of hand. You know, it just takes too much time to illustrate the concepts. So we'll go ahead and you know, use separate sheets for these examples. Um, on this particular sheet, we'll take a look at something that seems easy, which is 1111 minus zero, 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 zero. This is x, this is y, and then we have uh, q, t, and d. So by this time, I'm hoping everybody is already familiar with how to compute the q, how to compute the t, and also how to compute the d digits, because you know, that is on the test, okay? That is on the exam on Wednesday. But today is not Wednesday, so we'll just go ahead and you know do all the, all of this math here. T zero is usually assumed zero, except for the kind of question that we have in uh, exam one, in the first part. So right now we can just compute the Qs, which is the exclusive OR between the X and the Y. So by this time we should really have that understood. Okay, you know, that the Q bits are the exclusive OR of the X and the Y bits. So I'm just going to fill in these columns really quickly, like so. The T are basically the OR between not X and Y, and also not Q and T. So in this case, not X or Y is a zero, not Q and T is also a zero, so we have zero or zero, which means you know, this T here is a zero. Is that part okay? Does everybody understand why this T or T1 is a zero? So after that, it's kind of the same situation for all of the other bits or for all the other T bits. So they're all zeros in this case. And then the D bits are the exclusive OR between the Q and the T. So once again, we have one, 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 one here. So that's one subtraction. Are we doing okay so far with this particular subtraction? Okay, so we'll take a look at the next one. Uh, for the next one, we'll look at something that's a little bit easier. 
So we'll go ahead and look at something where well, we'll just reverse it. Okay, we have zero 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 minus one 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 one. Okay, so we just you know, turn it around. X becomes Y. Y becomes X. We still have Q T D to figure out. The Q is still the same because exclusive or itself is commutative, which means it doesn't matter which one is the one and which one is the zero. If you have one one and one zero on the two sides of exclusive or, the answer is still a one. So that means we still end up with one 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 over here. T zero is assumed to be zero, but this time T of one is a one because not X, oops, because not X and Y is a one. And that's enough because you know, that's one side of the or. So that means we have a one here already. The same argument goes for the other four, uh, the other three ones. <clears throat> and now when we look at the D bits, it will be um, a one over here, a zero over here, a zero over here, and a zero over here. Do we have any questions about binary subtraction or subtraction of any kind? No questions? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so then we move on to another one, okay? So now we move on to another subtraction. So this time we have one, zero, eh, we'll make one, zero, zero, one, minus zero, one, zero, zero. Okay, just make things a little bit more interesting. So once again, the, this is x, y, q, T, D, and the Q are the exclusive ORs between the X and the Y, so we got a 1 here, 0 here, 1 here, and a 1 here. T0 in this case is assumed to be 0, so if you look at bit 0, uh, not 1 and 0 is a 0, not 1 and 0 is a 0, so now we have 0 or 0 to be T1, so that's a 0 over here, and then when we look at T2, we have not 0 and 0, which is a 0. Not 0 and 0 is also a 0. Once again, we have 0 or 0, so we put a 0 here. And then for T3, we have not 0 and 1, which is a 1. But because it is on the left-hand side of an OR, that means the OR is going to be a 1, so that, that's why T3 is a 1. And then when we look at T4, we have not zero, not, excuse me, not one and zero is a zero. Not one and one is also a zero. So we have zero or zero, and that's why we put a zero over here. And then for the D bits, exclusive or between the Q and the T. So we got a one, zero, one, zero here. All right, I'll be still doing okay so far. Yes, okay. So let me just spell out a little bit of you know, what you should know at this point. You should know what the R function looks like, what the B function looks like for any base. And then you should also know what the R function looks like for base two using only logical operators. You should also know, you know how the B function looks like for base two only using only logical operators. So all of those are things that you should know by now. So that means if you do not, okay, you can come to my office hour after class or you know, go through the material and make sure that you understand why, you know, what they are and why they are the case, like that. All right, so we got one more case to go. And this time we have 0, 1, 1, 2. Oops, we're going to have a 2 here. So 0, 1, 1, 0 is fine. Minus 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, okay? So x, y, q, t, d again. <clears throat> so this time I'm not going to spell out you know, why I, how I came up with the digits because we did it already. Um, so we got a 1, 0, 1, 0 here. And then for the t, t0 is assumed 0 because we don't have anything to suggest otherwise. So now we have 1 here, a 1 here, a 0 here, and a 0 over here. And then when we look at the exclusive or between these, um, and we have, uh, okay, this is not the one that one, but that's okay. We'll, we'll work this one out too. One, one, zero, zero. 
That's the answer. And we'll work with one more. Okay. So we'll work with one more, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay. X, Y, Q, T, D. Exclusive or. And then we have the T, you know, bits to think about. It's a 0 here. It's a 0 here. It's a 0 here. And there's a 1 over here. And then we have the exclusive or between the Q and the T to give us the Ds. So we got 1, 1, 0, 1 over here. All right. So we have you know, worked out a few of the binary subtractions. So now the question is, how do we know, you know the ordering? How do we compare? So before we do that, we're going to scroll all the way back to the first slide. And I'm going to just talk about why it is important to only know whether the middle end is less than the subtrahend. That's all we need to know. The other ones, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, and not equal to, they can all be derived from just less than combined with Boolean operators. Okay, so we'll take a look at <clears throat> the six operators for comparing values. We got less than, well, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, and then not equal to. Okay, so we'll say, how do we say that? How do we say that? That, that, and that, and also that. All right. Well, x is less than y is not a problem, okay? Because we just need to know whether x, you know, the minuan is less than the subtrahend. So this one doesn't need any work because you know less than is the one operator that we want to support. We just want to not support the other ones. The other five, we say, eh, they're not necessary. X is greater than y if and only if y is less than x. Ah, that's easy because you just flip the left hand side with the right hand side. Not a problem. Less than or equal to, if x is less than or equal to y, it means it is not the case that y is less than x. Does that make sense? Okay. Are we still doing okay so far with this one? So this is what I said about, you know, we can use a logical operator combined with just less than to express something that is not just less than. So greater than or equal to, ah, it's easy. You just flip the order. Flip the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and you're all done. Are we good so far? What about equal to? Well, equal to is a little bit harder to express in a way. So we're going to express not equal to first. Not equal to is really saying that x is less than y or y is less than x. Because if at least one side is true and only one side really can be true at a time, because you cannot have x being less than y and y is less than x at the same time. That just cannot happen with integers. So this one basically spells out x does not equal to y. This is also why in certain type of programming languages, x does not equal to y can be expressed as x is less than or greater than y. That is an operator in certain programming languages to express not equal to. But in our case, in C++, it is using this notation to mean not equal to. I just want to give you alternative representations of the same operator to indicate that x and y are not the same, or checking whether they're not the same or not. So now that we know how to express x does not equal to y, to express x equals y, it's easy, because all we have to do is to negate x does not equal to y. So we just put all this chunk here within the, the parentheses. So I'm going to make it very obvious by copy and paste. Okay, So this is a block. I copy, and then I paste it. And where I play, you know, paste it, it's just going to be within the negation. And then switch back to my usual pen tool to finish the close parenthesis. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So that means, oh, so by making things a little bit more complicated, we can get away with only knowing 
whether a number is less than another number or not. We can then use logical operators to derive all of the other comparison operators. Are we still doing okay or not? Okay, all right. So now we go, we go back to the examples that we have illustrated. The problem with comparing is you really need to know how to interpret the bit patterns. In other words, in this case, when I look at what 0, 0, 0, 0 is not a problem, okay? Because whether it's signed interpretation or unsigned interpretation, 0, 0, 0, 0 is going to be just 0, not a problem. But 1, 1, 1, 1 is not like that. So this gets us, get, this gets us all the way back to the VS notation versus the VU notation. The question here is what is VS 1, 1, 1, 1, 4? And what is VU11114? Do we still remember VS versus VU? Because that is within the scope of exam one. Yes. Signed and unsigned. It is signed and unsigned interpret signed and unsigned value, right? You yeah. interpretation using the bit pattern as the first parameter and using the second parameter to indicate how many bits are we considering. Okay, can someone tell me what is VS11114? And I should emphasize these are base two numbers, so I'm going to put a suffix of two here. All right, yep. Negative one, because it is one plus two, okay, one plus two plus four minus eight. Okay, the most significant digit is indicating whether we need to subtract the most significant power of two or not. Okay? Are we still remembering that? I sure hope so, because you, you should be studying over the weekend, because this is the kind of stuff that will be in, potentially, in exam one. It's in the practice test. Go ahead. No, just, how, how did you get it quick, quickly? How do you do it quickly? Like for, for this, this value, signed value. So the way I do it is you look at one 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 one, you multiply this you multiply this one with the first power of two, you multiply this one with the next power of two, this one also the next power of two, but this one is multiplied by the negation, arithmetic negation of two to the power of three in this case. Then you just add them up. I see. So you multiply these two, you get one. Multiply these two, you get two. Multiply these two, you get four. Multiply these two, you get negative eight. Add them up, and you get negative one. That's how you approach the VS whole thing, you know, because of the VS definition. So do you know the definition of VS? Okay. Do you know the defi definition of VU? Do you know where to find it in the modules? So those are the questions that you should try to answer, okay? Before the test, hopefully before the test. Because otherwise, somebody look at the question with the references to VSVU without the definition in the exam, and I cannot give you the definition during the exam, okay? The exam, part of it is to test whether you know the definitions or at least know where to find the definition. It's open book and open notes. You can bring anything on paper with you on Wednesday. So there's no reason why people cannot regurgitate knowledge or definitions. Is that okay? And that's why in my exams, there are no point values or very few point values associated with knowledge because it's open book and open notes. I don't see any reason why that should warrant points. So all the points are associated with reasoning and being able to solve problems, which is the application of knowledge. All right, so I'm just going to answer this question here. This is negative one, and this is going to be what? Hmm? 15, that's right, because instead of subtracting the 2 to the power of 3, we're adding the 2 to the power of 3 in the VU interpretation or the unsigned interpretation. Okay, so in this case, we can see that in the sign interpretation, x is less than y, 
in the unsigned interpretation, x is not less than y. Does that make sense? Because negative 1 is less than 0 is true. 15 is less than 0 is not true. So now the question is, um, how do we do this? Okay. How do we know which, which operand is less than which other operand? So I'm going to add some more to here. Okay. <clears throat> so for 4-bit subtraction, t of 4 equals to 1 if and only if uh, v s x 4 is less than v s x, uh, excuse me, y more 4. This is a claim, okay, you know, in my notes in the module, I actually have a proof to show you why we can rely on t4 alone to indicate, I take it back, I actually made a mistake here, sorry. <clears throat> it's not s, it's u here. The unsigned interpretation, using the unsigned interpretation, the, the borrow bit, the last, the most significant borrow bit, by itself is already enough to tell us where, whether the unsigned interpretation of x is less than the unsigned interpretation of y. So we want to test this out too, okay? We want to check out the examples to see whether this is really the case or not. So now we switch back to the example. In this case, that's a zero, okay? So this zero is telling us that VU X4 is less than VU X4 is false. Does that make sense to you? What is the VUX4? I mean, it's on the whiteboard already. Someone can just have to read the whiteboard and tell me, what is the VU of X4? 15. And what is Y? What, is, what do you think is VUY4? Zero. Okay. So 15 is less than zero is false. Okay. So that seems to confirm what I said earlier. Okay. Let's, let's check the next one then. So this one here, we have, this is our T4. So T4 being a 1, okay, T4 is a 1, if and only if VUX4 is less than VUY4. This is just a copy of what I said earlier. So this time, you know, we already know what is VU of 0, 0, 0, 0. It's just 0. We know what is VU of 1, 1, 1, 1, which is 15. 0 is less than, 0 is less than 15. It's true, okay? So T4 seems to be pretty consistent at this point, okay? So now we say, hmm, okay. Oh, what did I do? What did I do? All right. I have to switch back to... No, 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 no. Nope. That is not good. There's a next page. Okay, so. Oh no, I just lost everything. Does it go back if you use like Control C? No, there's no quick and easy way. But it said it has six pages. So this is the last page. Okay, I'm good. I'm still good. Okay, I didn't lose all the pages. But I did lose. A significant portion of what we talked about. That's okay. It's all being recorded because the recorder is still on. <laughs> That's the good thing about having a recorder. All right. So it's okay. This is a conclusion of negative one is less than zero is, whoops, not negative one, 15. It's false because it is using the unsigned interpretation. 
Okay, so I do you know, apologize that you know, there's a technical fluke. It's kind of nice in a way because I have a cleaner slate now. So look at it on the bright side. There's always a silver lining. So this one is telling us that zero is less than 15. It's true. So far, so good. And then this one, as we've got a zero. So it's telling us, oh, this time, what is, v as, what is VU of X this time? The unsigned interpretation of X, 1001. What is it? Nine. nine. Very good, because it's one plus eight. Okay, so we have nine being less than, what, is, what about Y? What is VU of Y this time? Four. Four. Very good. It's false. Oh, okay. Zero means it's false. One means it's true. So far, so good. We have, I think, one or two more examples to go through. This is telling us, you know, X is a six, Y is a three. This is false. Okay, so far, so good. And it did not keep my last example. I'm going to have to rework that one. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. It's not a big deal. Zero, one, one, zero, minus one, one. One zero, uh, one zero one one. Okay, that's just slightly different from last time. I cannot re I cannot even remember what it was last time. Okay. All right. So there's a one here. There's a one here. Zero over here. One here. One one zero one. All right. So in this case, this one is telling us that six, which is zero one one zero is less than 1011, which is 11. Very good. Is true. All right. So, so far, all of these examples seems to confirm that T4 is a 1 if and only if the unsigned X is less than the unsigned Y. We seem to be good. Are we doing do okay so far? Okay. So the notes actually, you know, the module actually you know, have that conclusion as well. So let me switch to the module so that you know where it is coming from. And at this point, we have so much stuff that I'm just you know, going to use a search here. So comparison, there we go. So we are now talking about binary comparison. And the first one is to look at unsigned less than. And this is telling you exactly the same thing, except we're talking about M bits. So T of M is 1, which means you know, the one bit that is hanging out on its own is a 1, if and only if VU, the unsigned value, unsigned interpretation of the value of X using M bits, is less than the unsigned value interpreted from Y using M bits. So we have confirmed that. <clears throat> okay. All right. What about the signed interpretation? So let's go back to the examples and we'll take a look at the signed interpretation and see what is going on here. So the signed interpretation is a little bit more complicated. And it's complicated because in this case, so what about the VS interpretation of X? We talked about this already. It is But what is it? What is Vs x4? We add up all the powers of 2 corresponding to 1s, except for the most significant bit. It's negative 1. Very good. So we worked that out earlier. This is negative 1. This is 0. So we now neg say negative 1 is less than 0 is, well, it is supposed to be true. Okay, so that means the borrow bit T4 is not enough to tell, is, is, isn't telling us about the ordering of signed interpretation. Okay, but I'm going to do the same thing for all of the other ones. First, okay, so this is also easy. Zero is less than negative one. It's supposed to be false. Okay. Let me see. Yep, it's supposed to be false. The other one is supposed to be true. Okay, we'll take a look at this one. So the X is not a nine anymore in a signed interpretation. What should that one be? 
one zero zero one using the sign interpretation. What is the value? Negative seven. Very good. Good job. So negative seven is less than. What about zero one zero zero? What is the sign interpretation of zero one zero zero? It's still four because the most significant digit is not a one; it's a zero. So we don't have a subtraction at all, and then the least significant digits are still being summed up. So that means you know unless the most significant bit here is a one, then the signed versus the unsigned interpretation would still be the same because we're still adding up the powers of two corresponding to ones within those digits, and the most significant digit is a zero. Which means we don't have to, we are we are not subtracting anything. So this is supposed to be true, okay? And let's take a look at the next one. Okay, this one has uh, six is less than three. This is signed interpretation. It's also false because the signed interpretation of zero one one zero is still two plus four because we don't have a subtraction of eight here. The sign interpretation of 0011 is still 3 because it is still just 1 plus 2 because we don't have a subtraction of 8 again. Because the most significant bit, which is also known as the leftmost bit, is a 0. Okay? <clears throat> so now we take a look at the next one. This one has uh, 6 is less than, so we got 1 plus 2, which is a 3. 3 minus 8 is a negative 5. Is supposed to be false so I'm going to make it very clear this is unsigned this is signed this is unsigned this is signed unsigned signed unsigned signed okay and one more unsigned and signed all right, so with all the five examples we have shown here, we can now definitely tell that the T4 has nothing to do with the result of signed comparison. You cannot look at T4 at all, okay, to try to get a clue of whether X is less than Y. So let's go back to the notes here because it's, it's probably helpful to understand a little bit of the theory behind the, what we're going to talk about next. So I'm just going to divert your attention to this part first, okay? So are we all agreeing that x is less than y if and only if x, is, x minus y is less than 0? Just in general, consider x and y are both just integers. So using algebra, are you convinced that x is less than y if and only if x minus y is less than 0? All we are doing is we are subtracting y from both sides of the inequality. Are we good so far? Okay. But we have a special name for x minus y because x minus y is the difference. That's our d, right? So now you're really just looking at this whole thing. It's really just d. If d is less than 0, signed interpretation, then x is less than y. Does that make sense? So that means we just have to look at the most significant bit of D to determine whether X is less than Y, or at least so it would seem, okay? So now we go back to the examples to see if that is true. So we look at the first example first, okay? So we look at the first example. Uh, we are looking at the sign of the difference, which is this bit here. So this one seems to be telling us that X is less than y signed, and it is true, okay? Because you can see how these two are agreeing. Are we good so far? Because what you're seeing here is based on what we know about the represented value of the bit pattern, and doing the comparison by hand, we come up with the answer of, yes, it is supposed to be true. <coughs> This one over here is by observing the sign bit of the D of the difference, and it also suggests that X is less than Y should be true when it is signed. Does that make sense? Because we just earlier using algebra, we established that the sign of the difference 
should be sufficient to tell us whether x is less than y. Are we still making all the connections so far? Because if we're missing any connections right now, you know, raise your hand and let me know because I can explain that. Assuming that we are good, <clears throat> we look at the next one. We got a zero here, okay? So the zero is suggesting that in sign interpretation, x is less than y is false, okay? And according to the result here, it is consistent with, you know, just manually going through the comparison. Because we look at 0, 0, 0, and we say it's representing the value 0. We look at 1, 1, 1, 1, it's representing the value of negative 1. So by manual comparison, we know that 0 is less than negative 1. It's false. And then the sign bit of the difference is now agreeing also and say that, yep, you're good. X is less than Y is indeed false because D3 is a 0. So, so far, so good. So far, it seems like, you know, it's working. We'll take a look. We'll skip one, and we'll look at this example here and see whether that works or not. We have this sign B being a 0, okay? And it is suggesting that X is less than Y signed is false. Ah, it is agreeing, okay? So, so far, so good. But the other two examples would not be the same. This zero here is suggesting that um, x is less than y signed is false. And yet, now we have a disagreement. Because the manual comparison, looking at 1001 zero, zero, one, and knowing that it represents negative 7, looking at 0100 zero, 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 and know that it represents 4, when you do the comparison manually, we all agree that negative 7 is less than 4 is true. However, the sign bit, or bit D3, is now saying, oh, x is less than y is supposed to be false. So that's a disagreement, which means the, the sign bit, or the most significant bit of D alone, may not be enough. Okay, we'll look at why it is the case later on, but this tells us that we cannot just look at D3 alone, to determine whether the signed interpretation is less than or not, okay? But we have one last example here as well, okay? This is our last example. So this one suggests that x is less than y signed is true. But we know that is not the case. Because in this case, x is representing 6, y is representing negative 5 using the signed interpretation. By manually comparing, we know that 6 is less than negative 5 is false. But when you look at the sign bit of the difference, which is D3, it's, it tells us that x is less than y signed is true. So now we have some cases that work okay, where the sign bit of the difference alone is telling us the correct answer. And then there are other cases where it does not tell us the correct result. So now we want to look at you know, another thing. So I'm going to go through all five examples again. <clears throat> and this time what we want to do is to really look at the difference between x and y. So we are actually going to perform the subtraction. Negative 1, the whole thing, minus 0, is negative 1. The question is, is negative 1 within the range of values that I can represent when I look at four bits using the signed interpretation. That is a topic that we have gone over already when we, when we uh, went over the practice exam. <clears throat> the range of values for signed interpretation. So for four bits, what is the range? So I'm going to put it all the way back here and ask this question. What is the range of B as, you know, something for, how far can it go on the negative side, and how far can it go on the positive side? Negative 2 to the power of W minus 1 to 
Yep. So we are looking at negative 8 to 7. Anything outside of negative 8 and 7 cannot be represented using only four bits, signed, interpreted. Does that make sense? Okay, but, but why, right? You know, why is that the case? Because if you think about it, you have four bit positions. This one corresponds to, are we adding one? Are we adding two? Are we adding four? Are we subtracting eight? Those are the four, those are the four possible you know, questions you can ask. So if you want the value to be as negative as it goes, then you put a one here and then you put zeros over there. Does that make sense? That's as far to the negative side as you can go. And therefore we have the negative eight. What about positive? How positive, how positive can this go? Well, take this out, okay? Make sure it's a zero, so we're not subtracting anything, and maximize all the other ones. Make those all ones, right? So you have one, one, plus one, two, plus one, four. That's a seven. That's how we got the seven here. The equation that you quoted is really a generalization of this kind of observation, okay? Okay, so knowing it goes from negative eight to positive seven, so now we take a look at all the examples and see whether the result is in range or not. Is negative one within that range? Okay, so we say it is in range. And now we look at this one, which is zero minus negative one, which is one. Is that in range? Okay, so we say this is also in range. We look at the third example, and we ask negative seven minus four is supposed to be negative 11. Is that in range? No, okay? So we say this is an overflow situation, okay? So the word or the term overflow is very specific in this context. Overflow means the value is out of range, but only under signed interpretation, okay? So overflow has a implication that we are only looking at things from the signed pers perspective. Okay, so I'm going to put in parentheses here. This is basically out of range, signed of signed interpretation. There we go. All right, take a look at this one here. Okay, we got six minus three which is a three, is that in range? Okay, this is in range. And then here's our last example, which is six minus negative five, which is 11. Is that in range? Nope. So once again, we have an overflow situation. All right, so do you notice anything? What do you notice? The times when it doesn't agree or the times when it overflows? Exactly. The time when your manual interpretation tells you the answer is a false, but the sign bit tells you it is a yes. When they disagree, we have an overflow. This is one of the two situations. And then the other situation where we also have the disagreement is this one. We have a not equal here, meaning that the actual result is supposed to be true, but the sign bit suggests it is uh, false, we also have an overflow situation. Huh, okay. So as it turns out, this is the key, okay? When the result cannot be stored in four bits, then we have an overflow situation, and in those situations, the sign flag tells you the opposite of the correct answer. Is that okay? All right, does everybody see the pattern? I know this is not a definitive mathematical proof, but there is a pattern to it. I hope you guys are starting to see the pattern. So then the next question is, but then how do we know there's an overflow situation? Well, let's take a look at the overflow situation, the two overflow situation. Do you see how in this overflow situation, the actual value is negative but the act, but the um, VU, uh, sorry, VS, there. Okay, VSD4, 
What is that? It is Look at the bit pattern, okay? Do not think about the actual subtraction. Look at D as 0101. What is DS 01014? It's five. Well, not only is the answer wrong, the sign is wrong. It's not even on the, on the right side of the number line, okay? So let's take a look at the other one and see if this is a, a general pattern, okay? Look at this pattern here. So in this case, what is DS1011, which is our D? What is that? It's 1 plus 2 minus 8, okay? So that is negative 5, right? Okay, so this is negative 5. So you look at the negative 5 and you look at the actual answer of 11. The sign is, is right, is wrong, okay? The sign is completely wrong. Huh. So that, yes, go ahead. Are, are they two complements of each other? They're, mm, they're sort of two of each other. Okay. I'm not too concerned about what they are in terms of the value. I'm trying to figure out a quick way to see whether we have an overflow situation or not. Okay? So the sign is wrong. Okay? So the conclusion here is when there's an overflow, the sign of the difference is wrong. Okay, so if we generalize this whole discussion, and looking at the time, 11, 15, yeah, we still got time, it's, we're, we're good. So we look at X and Y, okay, so we only want to look at the most significant bit of X, okay, so the squiggly here, I don't really care. Squiggly here, I don't even, I don't care. So we have X minus Y. The entire row of Q, I don't care. The entire row of T, I also do not care. And then we look at D. The most significant bit, I do care. The rest of the, the bits, I do not care. So in other words, I'm only focusing on the most significant bit of X, the most significant bit of Y, and the most significant bit of D. Is that okay? Because that one bit of each row indicates the sign of the value of X, the value of y and the value of d. Are we doing? Are we still doing okay with that? The most significant, significant, or the leftmost bit, is telling us whether the value being represented using signed interpretation is negative or not. Okay. So now we look at. So assuming. Okay, we will assume your know, m equals four, which means we're dealing with four-bit numbers. So now we're looking at this and go like, hmm. Let me take a look at all the possible cases. Okay, we're looking at the most significant bit of X, Y, and D. And because they are more or less independent, I have eight possible cases. So this is also an application of the truth table. This makes sure that I do not forget a specific case, that I consider every single possible case here. Okay? And the question is, is the sign of D wrong. Okay. Yep. Oh, one 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 instead of one one zero. Yep. All right. This is supposed to be zero and zero one. Thank you. All right. So we go through every single row, then we ask the question. The first row is really asking. You have a non-negative number. You subtract a non-negative number from that, and the difference is non-negative. Can that happen? Let's see. 2 minus 1 is a 1. 1 minus 0 is a 1. Okay, that works. So we don't have a overflow situation or the sign is not wrong. Okay, it's actually okay. The next row asks, if I subtract a non-negative quantity from a non-negative quantity, can I end up with something that is negative? Sure. 2 minus 3 is a negative 1. The negative one is going to have D3 being 1. Okay, that can happen, which means it is not a problem. The third line, or the third row, is asking, if I subtract a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity and the result is non-negative, is that okay? 
perfectly okay. Okay, you subtract negative two from zero, you get two, and two is not negative. Okay, so we go like, yeah, this is okay. Not a, there's nothing wrong with it. Then we ask, you're subtracting a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity, and you end up with a negative quantity. Can that happen? That should never happen, right? So if it does happen, uh huh, we have a problem. The sign is wrong in that case. Okay, the next one, we subtract a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity. We end up with something that is non-negative. Can that happen? Cannot happen. Cannot possibly happen. So we have a problem with the sign again. And then the next one says, okay, if you're thinking this is getting boring because I already know what the results are, Good job, okay? It means you're following the discussion. On the other hand, if you're not following the discussion, you can put down some notes, okay? So you can review this particular part. Um, I did not display the time, but it's, I mean, it's 11.20 right now. So you can either review the discussion or you can come to my office hour. All right, so we are subtracting a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity and the result is negative. Can that happen? Sure. This is actually what we expect to happen. And then we have, you're subtracting negative from negative, ending with something that is not negative. Can that happen? Sure. Try to subtract negative three from negative two, you should get one. So that means this can happen. So that means it's not a problem. And then the last one can happen. You're subtracting a negative quantity from a negative quantity and you end up with something that's negative. Try subtracting negative two from negative three, you end up with negative one. Okay, it can happen. There we go. So are we good so far? Okay, all right. So we only have two possible cases where something can be wrong. So that those two specific cases is this one and that one. So if we, want, if we want to detect whether there's an overflow, there's one, so how do I come up with an expression where only this one is true? Okay, so I'm just gonna put a dash here. So what kind of expression is going to return true if and only if x3 is a zero, y3 is a one, and d3 is a one? And them all, but we have to not x3. Yep, okay, so you, you negate x3 first, and I'll put extra parentheses to make sure that we are negating x3 before we end with y3 and d3. What about this one? The opposite, right? x3 gets to be on its own, but, when, but then we have to end the negation of y3 and also the negation of d3, okay? So are we doing okay so far with how these two conjunctions would be true if and only if one of these two rows happen? But for all of the other rows, these expressions would be false. Is that okay? All right. So that means, hmm, because overflow happens in this case or in this case. So that means all we need to do is to or these two expressions, and that becomes our overflow. So if I were to generalize what overflow is, okay, so for m bit subtraction, the overflow flag is x of m minus 1, uh, the negation of y of m minus 1, and the negation of d of m minus 1, or the negation of x of m minus 1 and y of m minus 1 and d of m minus 1. This is a conjunction, this is a conjunction, and then the two conjunctions are ORed in order to tell us whether we have an overflow or not. All right. Okay. So, hmm, so what do we have here? Let's summarize what we have. We, we're going to call you know, D of M minus 1 a special name. It's called the sign flag. It is the sign of the result of the subtraction. 
So it has, it just has its own name, okay, that's all. But it really is just the most significant bit of the difference. So if we look at this, and then we ask the question, okay? Once again, we use a truth table. So we have, um, right, okay. So we have the sign flag, the overflow flag. The sign flag can be a zero or one. The overflow flag, even though it does depend on the sign flag, but it is also independent in a way because it depends on the other two flags, two bits as well. So these four possible, these four are the possible things. Okay, the sign flag can be a zero or one. While the sign flag is a zero, the overflow can be a zero or one. And while the sign flag is a one, overflow can also be a zero or one. But in the end, all this is tedious detail. The only question I want to ask is really just this. Vsx4 or m is less than Vsym. Is that the case or not? That's, that's the bottom line. Okay. So can someone tell me when the sign flag of the difference says, no, x is not less than y, and overflow says the result stays within the range that we can, uh, we can store, then is x less than y in this case? The sign, okay, in other words, do we have a reason not to believe in the sign flag? Nope, and if the sign flag says it's not less than, it is not less than. What about the next row? The sign flag says not less than. The overflow thing says, oh, but the result, the difference, cannot be stored in four bits. Okay, and what happens when that? You know, what happens when the result cannot be stored within the number of bits that we have allocated? The sign is off. So the overflow flag says the sign flag is lying. So if the sign flag says no, that means the correct answer is. Yes. Okay. The sign flag is telling us it is less than. The overflow flag says, yeah, you can trust the sign flag because it's, we don't have an overflow situation. So that means the actual result is a one. The sign flag says, yes, it is less than. Overflow flag says, don't trust the sign flag. It's lying. So the an actual answer is a no. You look at this truth table. Does it remind you of anything we have seen so far? Exclusive or. Exclusive or. Very good. So that means, you know, this, I call this the L flag for less than. So the L flag is really just the sign flag, exclusive or with the overflow flag. I spell overflow with not just an O, but a, with a V next to it, because it, it, otherwise it looks like a zero. That's all. All right, so you have everything that you need for today's lab, but more importantly, now we have a mechanism, two mechanisms, I should say, one to determine whether the signed value is less than, the other one to determine whether the unsigned value is less than. Unsigned is easy. Just look at T4 in the case of three bit, four bits. T4 alone is enough to tell us whether the minimum is less than the subtrahend. But for signed comparison, you have to rely on the L flag. The L flag depends on the S flag, which is really just the most significant bit of the D flag. And then the overflow flag is a little bit more complicated because it's defined like that at the top of this slide here. Is it tedious? Yeah, it's kind of tedious. But for the most part, everything translates into logic gates. Because what do we have here? The sign flag is nothing important because we have the most significant bit of the difference already. So there's nothing special except it has a special name. That's all it is. The overflow flag needs negation, 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 and then it needs conjunction. It needs conjunction. And then finally, it needs an OR. We know how to do all of those using transistors. Not a problem. Okay? So that means, in the end, we can now use only transistors to perform a comparison of binary numbers. Now, is it an unsigned binary number? Not a problem. We just look at T of 4. We know how to get to T of 4 already, way before this discussion. But what about signed interpretation? Well, it's a little bit more complicated because we need to figure out the overflow, which is this thing here. 
and we oops and it automatic it interprets my movement as a swipe so the other one is okay it's easier to use a mouse pointer the other one is just give a special name to the most significant bit of d and then we perform an exclusive or then we know whether the minor when is less than the subtrahend when they are interpreted signed in this case. All right, so I am going to take roll. Okay, so sign into Canvas, either on a mobile device or on the computer in front of you. And so I am going to re-emphasize, knowing how many people are kind of late today, uh, being on time is kind of important because otherwise you might you know, lose an earlier part of the discussion, making things a little bit less connected, you know, because you don't you didn't quite get the first part. So I just want to kind of point it out. Uh, the access code is a reminder. Study. So there we go. Oh, the time is off. You know, I need to give you guys a little more time. Give me a second here. I'll give you plenty of time. All right, so should be able to do it now. So just refresh the browser. I think just clicking the, on the link again should work. All so generally speaking, there's a correlation between, you know, whether people are consistently late to come to class. When I say late, I'm not talking about five or 10 minutes late. I'm talking about an hour, 45 minutes kind of late. So there's a consistency or there's a correlation between that and the performance or lack thereof in the class. I only can say that it's a correlation. I cannot say one causes the other one, but there's a strong correlation. I just want the class to understand that part. Alrighty, um, let's see. We still got time today. We still have about 20, you know, maybe 18 minutes or so. Are there anything, is there anything you want me to go over related to binary subtraction or comparison that we have talked about? Because this is the conclusion of everything that we have talked about so far. How do we represent values in base two? What is signed versus unsigned you know, interpretation? How do we add? How do we subtract? And now, how do we compare? So we are pretty much done with integers. We are going to move on to uh, what we call floating point numbers. Uh, that would be our next topic for next Monday. This Wednesday, we have exam one. So I won't have any lab activities for you for this particular Wednesday, because you know, there won't be time for me to introduce any new concepts. But are there any questions before we move on on next Monday to almost an entirely different topic? Any question about exam one? Based on you know, the exam one in spring 2023, or do we have any questions? Okay, <clears throat> because if there are no questions, I am moving on to you know, floating point number representation. Or I should first introduce what is the scientific notation. Alrighty. Okay, well, I, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and let me know, okay? All right, so moving on to scientific notation. Okay. Does anyone know what this means? Negative one point two three e negative forty five. Okay. Uh, well, negative one point two three times ten to the negative forty five. That is correct. Okay. So I'm going to. This is a C notation. You know, you can call it a float. You can call it a double. You know, because there are two types in C plus plus that can use these notations to represent the value. So this is indeed 1.23 times 10 to the power of negative 45. 
This is called a scientific notation. Okay, so we'll I'll also say here this is called a scientific notation. It's called a scientific notation because when you take a class in physics, you typically have to deal with or chemistry. You typically have to deal with numbers of huge magnitude differences. We are not talking about billions. We are not talking about trillions. We are not even talking about two to the power of sixty-four. Okay, which is a really large value, but even those compared to the speed of light, or the number of molecules in a mole, you know that sort of stuff, or the charge of a single electron in volts, those are extreme values when it when it comes to the magnitude. Okay, and unless you really feel like writing a lot of zeros, this is much nicer. Okay, because the alternative is to write a lot of zeros, you know, on either. On the right hand side or on the left hand side of the point. Okay, so this is a handy way to do things. So we'll also introduce some terms. Okay, this part here is called the coefficient. Coefficient. I cannot spell. C i e n t. I think co e coefficient. Okay, that seems right to me. And this is the exponent. The exponent. In this case, the exponent of ten. So those are the two, you know, main parts, you know, of a scientific notation. And then when the coefficient falls within a certain range, it also has a different name. Okay. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm I'm just going to call this c. Okay, because it's just a whole lot easier to write c itself. So if c is greater than or equal to zero, and c is less than, oops. So、oh, this is a C. This is a C. It's less than the base, which is base ten in this case. Then the co e coefficient is also known as the mantissa. Okay. So in this case, you know, except for the arithmetic negation, one point two three itself can be seen as the mantissa. Are we still doing okay so far with the scientific notation? Okay. So all this really is is you have the mantissa to deal with the precision. Okay, the more digits you have in the mantissa. The more precisely you're describing a value, for instance, the speed of light. Okay, you can say it's 290 million miles per million, 290 million kilometers per second. I think, is that correct? Okay, so in this case, I'm using only two significant digits, 29, right? Or in this case, 2.9 times 10 to the power of, let's see, 290. So that would make it a eight. Okay. But you can also have more digits with the mantissa to get you more precision when you're describing the speed of light. So the number of digits that you allocate to the mantissa is determining the precision of the value, or the precision of how you can express the value. The exponent, on the other hand, which is this part here, oops, where's my mouse cursor? There we go. So this part here, the negative forty-five and the negative forty-five here, is determining The magnitude that you can express. So we are now separating precision, which is the mantissa, from the magnitude, which is controlled by the exponent. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So now we take a switch here. Instead of looking at things in base ten, now we look at things from the base two perspective. Okay. So I would I would use a number, a certain value, and I go like, can we use The scientific notation in base two to express the same value. That's what we're going to do next. So I'm going to pick a value like sixty-seven point one two three, one two five. Sorry, this is in base ten. So now the first thing we do is base conversion. Do you guys still remember base conversion? I certainly hope so because that is also in the scope of exam one. So one definition that you might remember. Is d of i is the floor of the value that we need to represent 
divided by 2 to the power of i, and then take the result of this and mod it with 2 in this case, if base 2 is what we are converting to, right? I hope you guys do remember this one. Yes? Okay. So in this case, you're know, using this conversion thing, or you can look at you know 67.125 and you ask yourself, how do I use non-recurring powers of two or the a sum of non-recurring powers of two to express 67.125? Uh, that's not too hard because I thought of this example because I wanted it to be easier on me. So it's 64 plus two plus one that handles the 67, right? And then the 0.125, yeah, that's just one eighth. Or if I prefer, okay. So now I have you know, two to the power of six, which is the 64, two to the power of one, which is the two, two to the power of zero, which is the one, and two to the power of what for the one eighth? Negative three, very good. Okay, so I'm glad that you guys are still retaining what you, you know, what you have learned with the exponents and stuff like that. Okay, so here's the next part is how do we write two to the power of six as a base two number? That's an easy one, okay? Any power of two can be written in base two just by saying it's a one followed by the number of, the number of zeros is the same as the power itself. So we got six zeros here, one, two, three, four, five, six, done. What about two to the power of one? We have a one here and a zero because it's two to the power of one. What about one? Well, we just have a one here. There's no zero after it because it's two, two to the power of zero. Okay, so what about the negative three? Well, that's why we have a decimal point. So the decimal point is separating from the non-negative powers to the negative powers. So the next place is gonna be um, two to the power of negative one, we got none of those. And then the next one is two to the power of negative two, which is, ne which is one quarter, we have none of those two. And then the next one is two to the power of negative three. So two to the power of negative three is 0 0.001 in base two. So I really have to emphasize that all of these are base two numbers, okay? So if I were to say, let's add up all of these things, what does it look like as a base two number? Can you answer that question? Exactly, because each place can only have up to one one, so we don't have to worry about carrying at all. So now we have one followed by four zeros, one, two, three, four, oh, yes, four, and then we have another one, and then the one here, and then zero, zero, one, that is how 67.125 is represented as a base two uh, number. Are we good so far? Of course, someone is gonna look at this and go like, I don't see how this has anything to do with the scientific notation. Okay, well, then we're gonna look at this, okay? One, zero, one, two, three, four, one, one, point, Zero, zero, 001. If I were to multiply, okay, first of all, are we all agreeing that this is preserving the value? Okay, divided by two, multiply by two, yep, it should be the same thing. But if we are just concerned about this division by two, what do you think it's going to do to the number itself? It's going to shift oh, the decimal point left. The, yes, the decimal point shift to the left relative to all the digits. In other words, this decimal point is going to go here if we don't want to write division by two. Does that make sense? Okay, now how does it make sense? Because after you divide it by two, what used to represent an eighth is now representing a sixteenth. What used to represent a quarter represents an eighth. What used to represent a half is representing a quarter. What used to represent a one is now representing a half. So that means the point just have to poop, go over here. Okay? So I'm just gonna write that as one, zero, 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 one point, one, zero, zero, one, 
times 2 to the power of 1. Now we do OK. So you look at this one step here, and you go like, OK, but Tech wants to shift this point all the way here so that we have a mantissa, so that the coefficient qualifies as a mantissa. So how many times do we have to do that? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. OK, I need to do the division on the coefficient side five more times, which means I also have to increase the power of two by five, you know, five more times. So by skipping a whole bunch of steps, now I say this is the same thing as one point. One, two, three, four, one, one, zero, zero, one, times two to the power of six, because one plus five is six. Is that okay? Okay, well, I always want to double check, okay? I want to make sure that this is okay. This one here is representing two to the power of six. So this one here is the same as that one, one over here. And this one point, whatever, I don't even care what it is, but it's all ultimately multiplied by two to the power of six. So that means this one is still telling us how many two to the power of six we have. It's just that it is expressed a little bit differently. Are we still doing okay? So I want to re-emphasize you know, which parts are base two and which parts are not base two. So I'm just adding a subscript of two to indicate those are all in base two. Is that okay? Are we seeing this as, oh, so this is an odd kind of scientific notation. Instead of using base 10 scientific notation, now we have a base two scientific notation. We have the mantissa, okay? This coefficient now qualifies as a mantissa because it is greater than or equal to zero, and yet it is, uh, actually, I take it back. It has to be greater than or equal to one, not zero, but it's less than two because two in base two is one zero. This is one point something, so it's clearly less than one zero. So this qualifies as a mantissa, and then we have an exponent, except the exponent is not a power of 2, it is a power of, excuse me, it's not a power of 10, it is a power of 2. So that means we can use the same idea in order to be able to represent um, values of a huge magnitude difference. Are we still doing okay so far with this? I'm looking at the time, we still got three more minutes. So after the exam, I won't do it you know, before the exam, but after the exam, over the weekend, I would read the um, IEEE double precision floating point number representation module because it really kind of goes into the detail to talk about not only the representation itself, but also as a standard, how do computers talk to each other and be able to say, okay, this is pi, okay? And you transmit a bunch of zeros and ones, and then the other computer looking at the zeros and ones also have to reinterpret that bit pattern and say, oh, this is pi. This is the value that I'm interpreting, and it's the same as what the transmitting computer wants to convey. So that standard is the IEEE standard. The reason why you have a double type is because the full name is the IEEE double precision floating point number representation. That's where the double is coming from. But that suggests one thing, right? That it suggests that there has to be a different floating point number format that has to do with not being the double. So what is what do you think is before the double? Single. single, exactly. So there is also a single precision floating point number representation in the IEEE standard. All right, so those are all topics that will not be in your exam one. So for now, I would just kind of focus on exam one. But after exam one, okay, you know, after you recover from what you think you did in the exam, it's time to move on and study, you know, the uh, floating point number representation. So I think I've done this with this class already, but since I do have another minute and a half or so, I do want to point out, you know, for this class, a C is greater than or equal to 37.5% of the score in an exam or any assessment. So 
Okay, so keep that in mind because every after every single exam one of all of my classes, I got people who we come into my office slightly panicking and go like, "Oh, I'm gonna flunk out of this class." Why do you think so? Well, I think I'm gonna get a sixty percent you know out of the the exam. Go like sixty percent is actually really close to a B already. You're you're doing okay, not great, but okay. So just keep that in mind. But the way I score is based on: Are you giving me evidence to show me that you know how to solve the problems in a step-by-step -step manner? Okay. So if you have any questions about, okay, how do I show you it is step by step? It really has to go back to the definitions, how you connect the definitions to the question, and how you go from one step to the next step using either just usual arithmetic, logic, or more definitions. So you have to give me all of those steps, okay? Because they show me that you know how to solve the problems. But why not just the final answer? Well, because I know you guys have fancy, you know, graphing calculators that are programmable. If I were you, I would program everything that I have taught in this class and automate everything on my calculator, so I can punch in anything and it would just give me the answer. <laughs> because I'm not concerned about whether your calculator knows how to do it. I'm concerned about whether you know how to do it or not. So that's why you have to show me the steps. And just in case anyone is asking or thinking, yes, when I took linear algebra, I actually programmed my computer because my calculator did not have enough memory to come up with all the in, you know, matrix inverses and stuff like that. You know, why do it by hand when I can program my computer to do the same thing? When I studied music theory, okay, that's a long time ago. I had a calculator. It's a larger calculator, but I can just you know type in I want the F minor scale. It'll give me all the flats. <laughs> because it's also a mathematical problem. Okay, you know, it so that's why you know I need to make sure that you guys know, you know what you're doing, not just that you have a program to do what I think you should be doing. All right, so we are out of time for the lecture. I am going to transition to your lab. So you do have a lab today. And depending on how much of the material you got from the lecture itself, for those of you who read a little bit before the class, you know, I think it would not be a problem at all. So this is subtraction and compare. This is your new lab. The access code is overflow. I will, I will write it on the whiteboard. Just overflow. And you have until 120 to turn it in. So let me publish it right now. I'm pretty sure I set the time up correctly this time. So you should be able to refresh the browser and get started with this lab. And once again, the task code is access code is overflow. And with that, I'm going to stop the recorder. If you have any questions about the lab, you know, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer those questions.